Hey everyone, in this video, I wanted to provide a Logic Apps for anyone. It was gonna be IT pros originally, but my goal of this video is to really walk through the complete set of functionality in terms of well, what can I do and how do I do the things in Logic Apps? It doesn't have to be an IT pro, this really can apply to anyone. As always, this is useful, a like and subscribe is appreciated. Now this is a follow-up to the video I posted a week ago, which was, well, what are the hosting options for Logic Apps? Because Logic Apps is one of the key serverless offerings we have available in Azure, just like Azure Functions. We have something happening, some trigger, this could be a recurrence, it could be some kind of restful call. It could be someone writes something to a storage account or many, many other things when I can integrate with things like Event Grid. But something that's going to trigger it, then it's going to do some work. And I only potentially pay for the work it's doing, but that's going to depend on how I host my Logic App because there are different plans available, which is what I covered in the other video. Now, unlike Azure Functions, as you can kind of see on the screen here, it's a designer, it's very graphical. I have this flow from the trigger through to performing various actions. And I don't have to be a developer. I don't need to know how to code. I can use these really nice just actions and operations available to complete the set of functionality I want. So I can think about really that citizen developer. I, anyone can create these things. So we have a trigger, hey, this is what's gonna make it run, then I have a series of actions which are the steps of the workflow that it's going to actually perform. Now, you may have heard of Power Automate, and Power Automate is built on Logic Apps. So once I know Logic Apps, I really understand Power Automate, formerly known as Microsoft Flow, as well. There is some difference in functionality, there's difference in licensing, but the key thing to think about is, hey, if I'm trying to do a task for me, I'll probably use Power Automate. If I'm trying to automate some task for my department, for my company, well then I'm probably going to use Logic Apps. Now the best way for me to walk through the key goals and ideas around Logic Apps is we're just gonna create a Logic App completely from scratch. So yes, I've got one open here, and we're gonna recreate this from scratch. Now, when I think about using Logic Apps, so I'm actually just gonna pop out this for a second. I'm gonna mimic the Azure function I created a few weeks ago. So we're gonna shut down any running virtual machines. Now to that point, I currently have one virtual machine running. So if I go and refresh this, I just have that middle VM over here. This one is running. So really I should just stop that one VM as part of my workflow. So we're gonna go ahead and create a new one. So when I create my new Logic App, just like everything else, it gets created in a resource group. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new resource group. We'll call it Logic App. Remember resource groups we use to group together different resources that share a common life cycle. They create together, they're gonna to run together, ultimately get deprovisioned together. I've already got that, so we'll call that Logic App Demo. I'm gonna give it a name. So I'm gonna call it Shutdown VMs. It's gonna be a workflow. I'm not gonna use a Docker container, which is gonna contain the code I wanna run. It's just a regular workflow. I'm gonna go ahead and create it in a region, just like everything else. It's gonna go in South Central US. Now for the plan, this is where I went into that detail in the other video. I want to just pay for the work it's doing. I don't need more advanced features. I don't need network integration as such. Um, so I'm just going to use the consumption option. And you get a certain amount of this free as well. So I'm going to say, hey, it's consumption. I don't need zone redundancy. I don't need any tags configured. So I'm just going to go and create this very, very simple consumption logic app. And what we'll see here is it's one logic app per workflow. So I can't have multiple workflows in one logic app. So that's got created. So now we'll go and jump over to that resource. 
Now the first thing here is it's gonna open up Logic App Designer and straight away we can get an idea of what is the goal of this. Again, that citizen developer, it gives me examples. So it gives me common triggers. Hey, a message is received on a service bus queue, a HTTP request, someone tweets. So hey, someone could tweet, I could go and call machine learning services to do a cognitive sentiment analysis. Is it positive, is it negative? And then maybe send an email or do something else. Hey, a file's created in OneDrive. A file is added to an FTP server. There are even complete templates that list together, hey, common types of flow I might want. So this would populate the workflow with all of these built in. I might have to give it credentials and details for the exact connections I want, but then it's gonna set all of this up for me. So it gives you straight away some nice ideas. Hey, daily reminders, email to me. Deliver an SMTP email on new tweets. Share my tweets on Facebook. So hey, I tweet sync, it's gonna grab it and post it to Facebook. So you have all of these just built in. I'm gonna pick that scenario of creating um, where I just want to delete, sorry, shut down any running virtual machines. So I want to start with a blank logic app. So here we're going to say, okay, blank logic app. So the design is going to be completely blank. So the first thing I need, well, I have to actually trigger off of something. Now I'm going to do this as a recurrence. So if we go through, I'm going to choose an operation. Now the first thing from here, I'm going to open up this side card is, well, I have to go and add what is this trigger. Now you'll notice I'm using this new canvas. If I turn this off and then on again, you'll notice now it's asking me for the connectors. There's a few oddities today, unfortunately, with this new canvas. You notice it's not letting me actually choose something. So if you hear a problem, just turn that off and then I can search all of the different connectors and triggers. So straight away, I can have this idea of all. So this is all of the different triggers, all of the actions available across all these different connectors. Now we'll see there are built-in connectors. This is where the functionality is just native to Logic Apps. It's not having to wrap some other API to call some other service. It's just built into Logic Apps. Then there are standard connectors. So this is, again, a connector is a wrapper around a certain API. So hey, there's standard connectors for Office, for SharePoint, for FTP, there's a huge number of these. And then there's Enterprise. And I pay different amounts of money for the different connectors that I'm actually going to use. I can even add custom connectors. Well, for me, I just need a built-in. And notice I have a breakdown here of triggers and actions. So I'm gonna pick schedule and it's a recurrence. Now straight away here, I can pick, hey, what is the interval? What is the frequency? So I might say, well, every day and it's every one day. And then I can add parameters, so a start time. So when I want this to start, so I can add that. And now if I actually switch to new canvas now, so now it's actually worked. So now that recurrence is there. It's just this is very new, the new canvas, you may not even see it yet. So you realize there's a few um, oddities around that. So let's just actually make sure you can see the screen. So here I can go back to my interval every day and hey, what's my start time? So maybe I want it to start at a certain hour. So I'm just gonna set a date in the past. Maybe I want it to start at 7 p.m. And I can just do that. But I can do other things as well. Maybe I only want it to run certain days of the week. So here I could say, well, actually the frequency I want every week, but now I could add parameters of on these days. So now I'll say, well, just join the week, for example. I could also be more specific and say, well, only at these hours and at these minutes. So I could be even more exact to say, hey, I want it to start at midnight, only and minute only. So I can be super specific about how I actually use that recurrence. So this is now my trigger. This is what's gonna make this spring into life. 
And then obviously what I want to do is add actions. So now I have this plus to insert a new step. So here we can see this. So I'm going to hit this and add an action. So once again, I get this same list available to me. Hey, I have all the built-in connectors. I have the standard, the enterprise, but now there's things I want to do. Now in my case, I want to actually track the VMs I'm going to shut down. So I'm going to want to shut down all the running VMs, but I want to make a note of, well, what are the VMs as I shut them down? Now, the other thing to notice here is I have this idea of an inline code. If I can't do something easily through, hey, the connectors, through the actions, I could just write JavaScript. So I can always go and hook into JavaScript directly from here. I can also call things like an Azure function. But in this case, hey, I want to use variables. So if I look at my built-in and I click this little down arrow, I actually have the option here of variables. Now also notice some of the other things you have here. Hey, HTTP, control operations, batch, data operations, manipulating data, date, time, flat files. Hey, I can call other logic apps, schedule, XML. So there are many things I can do just with the built-in. So I'm gonna say a variable. And what I want to do here initially is just initialize a variable. So I'm gonna say initialize variable and I have to give it a name. So I'm gonna call it list of VMs and my type, well, I wanna have multiple entries. So it's gonna be an array. I don't need an, addition, an initial value. So that's it. So the next thing I wanna do is I want to go and look at, well, what are all of the virtual machines that I have in my subscription? So I'm gonna once again, I'm just gonna hit save. I wanna do that periodically up here in the top. I can go and hit save. So I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna add another step. I'm gonna add an action. And this time it's one of the standard and I'm gonna search for Azure Resource Manager. And there it's found me my Azure Resource Manager connector. And I wanna list all of the resources in my subscription. So I have this option of list resources by subscription. So I'm gonna use that. Now notice what's happening here. I have to authenticate to something. So I have to sign in. So if I just hit save for a second, it's gonna fail because I don't, haven't completed this. But if I quickly just come out of this, I can add it back in a second. If we go down to the identity of our logic app, I need to actually go and turn on this system assigned identity. So I'm gonna turn that on and hit save. So now it's creating a new managed identity system assigned, I could use user assigned for this particular logic app. Now what I'm gonna do super quickly is I can add role assignments here but I'm gonna to go to my subscription, access control, and at the subscription level for that logic app, I'm going to give it VM contributor. So that's gonna let it stop and start any of my virtual machines. So just search for virtual machine contributor. So it's this role and I'm gonna give it to a managed identity and it's gonna be from my logic apps and there's my shutdown VM. So I'm giving that new managed identity for my new logic app permission to be a contributor on any virtual machines. So that's added that role assignment. So now we're gonna jump back to our logic app, go back to our designer and I'll have to go and re-add that step. So we're gonna add it again. And remember the benefit of a managed identity is I don't have to store a secret anywhere. The fact that this workflow is running as this logic app means it just authenticates automatically as that identity. So now I can say list resources by subscription again. I'm gonna connect with my managed identity. So I've got this option right here. 
I'll give it a name. So this is gonna be my AZ um, dev managed identity. Just gonna call it that. So it's gonna create a new connection for my Logic app, which I can then use in other steps as well. I don't have to continually recreate this connection. So I hit create. And now what it wants to know is, well, maybe that managed identity had access to multiple subscriptions. In my case, I'm just gonna select the dev subscription. And that's all I need to do. So, hey, I've got my dev subscription and it would now list all of the resources. However, I don't wanna list them all. I just wanna see the virtual machines. So I'm gonna add a new parameter. I'm gonna add a filter. And now I can type in well, what is that filter that I actually want? So it's the resource type. I want the resource type to equal from the Microsoft Compute Resource Provider virtual machines. So I'm just gonna type in resource type equals Microsoft.Compute virtual machines. And that's really all I need to do to list out all of the VMs. So I can now hit save. And one of the great things I can do with Logic Apps is I can test them and see what it's gonna do at any point. So I'm actually gonna jump up to the top and I can do run trigger and from this hit run. So it's gonna go and run and show me the results. So here we can see it executed very quickly, but it did list resources by subscription. If I select this, I can see the details of actually what it did. So I can see the value of the output. Well, there's one VM, demo Linux VM. There's a second VM, demo VM, and a third VM, demo VM SRV. So we can see all of those values in the output. It's showing me exactly the output. And that lines up because I have three virtual machines. The challenge is it's not showing me is it running or not? So I'm gonna to have to do some other things to actually get the detail that I need. But it did give me this useful ID. And if we look at the ID, it's the subscription, the subscription number, the resource group. Okay, it's all of the detail I need to go and get more information. And also we know there are multiple values. We have this array of values of these three different virtual machines. So now I need to do something for each of them. I need to go and look them up. Remembering I have this very useful ID that references each of the individual virtual machines. So I'm gonna jump back to the designer by hitting the designer button. And this time I wanna add another step, another action. And this is a control. So I need to go through each of the values. So for each of them, I want to do something. So I'll go to Again, this will be built in, control, and it's a for each. So I'm gonna add a for each. And then I select, well, what am I doing a for each on? And it's a for each of, hey, listing those resources by subscription. So it's the value that it outputted. So if I select this, notice I have variables and I have resources by subscription outputs, i.e. value. I can also create expressions. So I can manipulate multiple objects or other expressions to get values. But for now, I'm just gonna use the value of the previous step. So that previous step was list resources by subscription. So for each of the values, I want to perform this particular set of things that I'm gonna do. So, okay, that's perfect. So now I've got this for each loop and I'm gonna add a step within it. Now, what I need to do at this point is get detail and the instance view of each virtual machine. Now, if I look at the Azure Resource Manager, there isn't actually a way to get the running status of a virtual machine. There's no built-in task that's gonna give me what I want to do. So at this point, well, I need to do something else. So I'm gonna use the HTTP built-in and just call the Azure Resource Manager RESTful API. 
Now, this is useful if you're interacting with any kind of API that there isn't a built-in connector for. Now, if I was to go and look at just the documentation for Azure, I can see, hey, there's a virtual machine get. And it tells me, well, I have to call HTTPS management.azure.com, okay, and then slash, slash subscription, subscription ID, resource groups. Well, that's the value of ID. Remember that we got from the value. I already have this. This is from that previous step we ran. I have this complete element here. All of this slash subscriptions is sitting in that ID field. And I just have to add, okay, question mark, API version, etc. So I can take this. Also notice there's optional parameters where I can expand out certain things. And one of those is an instance view. So I know, well, that's what I want to use. So in my method for my HTTP, well, my method is get, it told us that in the documentation. And then what I need to call is that HTTPS management.azure.com. And then, well, in that list resources by subscription, I want the ID. That's gonna give me that slash subscription, slash subscription ID, et cetera, et cetera. And I just need to add to this that expand instance view and the API version. So I already have this tucked away. So basically notice I can mix in static text with dynamic content that's getting from previous steps. So at this point, I need to do one other thing. I need to add authentication. So I have to authenticate to the Azure Resource Manager. The good news is I can just authenticate with that managed identity. The audience is already by default management.azure.com, so I don't have to put that in. So that's now gonna go and get the detail for each of those virtual machines. Now realize, if there was maybe a different API that needed a different secret, I could also integrate with things like Azure Key Vault, where I can store secrets, certificates, keys, and utilize them from there. So there are other ways that I could get that. And I'll quickly show you that built-in provider in a second. So if I hit save, it should now go and get for each VM, the instance view. And if I did want to use Key Vault, if I had some secret in here, you would give the managed identity permission to the Key Vault of the particular secret. So I'm not having to store anything else to get to it. And then sure enough, we have Azure Key Vault and I could go and get secrets. And then I could use that in other steps. So that's how I can actually go and leverage those types of things. But I don't actually want to do that. So I can right click and do delete. And we could try and run this again. So once again, I'm just gonna do run. And now what it should do is for every VM, go and call that API. And notice now in the for each, remember there were three records. Well, notice we have three. And what I can do is I can move through them. I could move to the next or last failed. I don't have any failures or just the next or last record. So record one, well look, here's the output, the detail of that virtual machine. And the thing we're looking for and what we're gonna key off of, there's gonna be an instance view. And in that instance view, we have this power state. Now this one is turned off, but we'll be looking for one where it's power state slash running. So now we know, okay, we have this huge JSON that's gonna give us the details. If I go to the next record, this should be my running virtual machine. Now this has got a bit more because it's a bigger VM and there's a bit more to it, but somewhere in all of this mess, we would see that provisioning state and we would see it running. There we go. So this one we can see, okay, power state running. Now notice there are many of these code entries in here among many statuses entries. So once again, we're gonna to have to kind of enumerate through to find out, well, is there one that has power state running in it? 
and I could see the next record as well. So I need to parse, in my case, all of this JSON. So I'm actually gonna take this body and copy it for a second. Because now what I need to do is, well, I need to actually go and look at the content. But right now I'm just gonna have this one big output, which is not super useful to me. So let's go back to the designer, knowing we've nearly got what we want. I'm gonna add another action. And this time what we're gonna to need to do is pass some data. Now one thing I will actually point out that I've not been doing Notice these steps, the names are not super useful. I could absolutely go to for each, and I could say, well, for each VM. For this HTTP, I could say, get VM detail. So I can absolutely rename these to be more meaningful, so I can see, well, A for me, what everything is doing, but also other people that may come and use this workflow later on, they can more easily see, well, what, what is this thing really doing? So now I'm gonna go back to my built-in, and what I wanna do now is a data operation, and I wanna parse JSON. What is the content I want to parse? Well, notice I can see all of the different outputs from the previous steps. Well, I want to look at the get VM detail and the body. So I just want to go ahead and parse the body output of getting the VM detail. Now it needs a schema to be able to parse this. But the good news is I had the output from the previous step. So I can use a payload and I'm just gonna paste in the body from the previous step. And it generates the schema for me. So that, that was nice and easy. And hit save. So now for every VM, it's gonna go and get the detail. And now it's parsing the JSON, there's gonna be a certain code, which if it has power state running, I want to do something. So I need to now check, is it running or not? So if I do add an action, well, it's gonna be a control and it's a condition. Now, what is my condition this time? Well, my condition is a certain value. And notice now it's passed the JSON and it's broken it down into all of the various elements of the JSON. And what I'm looking for is code. So if I keep scrolling, there's code, there we go. But notice, what has it suddenly done? Well, it knows there's multiple elements, instances of code in multiple instances of statuses. So it's automatically added a for each for me. It added the for each because it knows, well, I can't just look at code because code is part of multiple statuses. You need to go and look at each status so I can go and find the code you want. So we just gone and put in a for each. So I'm gonna say for each status and it's outputting and if I hover over it notice it's telling me oh it was a bit slow it's showing me hey it's that instance view as I hover over its properties instance view statuses so now if I go back to my condition now I can use the code and what do I want well I want it if it's power state equals running and I'm gonna say contains because there's multiple of them. So, hey, if for each of the status, go and look at all of the codes, does it contain power state running? Okay. So then what do I wanna do? So now I've got this nice check. What can I do? Well, I know, and this is an easy quick test to see if my logic is right. If it's true, I'm gonna add an action. Remember I had that variable. So what I want to do is I'm gonna to append to an array variable. So I'm gonna append to array variable, but we'll say add VM name to um, list of VMs. There's my variable. And my value 
is going to be, well, I've got different ways of doing this, but the name of the VM was all the way back at the start from my Azure Resource Manager list, there was name. So I'm just gonna use that. I'm gonna hit save and let's see what it does. So if I now run it again, obviously I'm not shutting it down yet, but it should, if it's running, add it to that variable. So we can see, well, for my first record for each VM, action branching condition was not met. It never went to true because remember my first VM is stopped. Only my second one is running. So if we move to the next record, the next VM, hmm, action branching not met either. Ah, oh, but there's two statuses, remember? If I move to the second one, I would have expected one of these to show. Maybe it's the next one. Let's keep looking at all of them. Let's see. So it was skipped. 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 We're going to keep going. Sometimes this doesn't exactly show. I do think that would have worked. So let's just keep... Let me check my condition though. Expression, result false, one. Check it, it's definitely running, yeah. Okay, so maybe I did something wrong actually in my condition. So let's go back and look at my condition again. Go back to my designer. Oh, huh. So this is strange, my value is gone. So that's odd. So again, there are some little bugs you might see. So I'm actually gonna go back and re-add code. So that's why it didn't work, is because for some reason, and I've seen this happen before, when it automatically adds in that for each, it seems to lose what that code was. So let's try and save it again. Okay, so now we know it's there. Let's select R for each, R for each. Sure enough is our statuses, our condition, definitely has code in it this time. Let's run that one more time. Okay, so fingers crossed this time. So our action branching is not met. If we go to our second VM, action branching condition not met. Still saying not met. Ah, but not on this one now. Notice this one has just got a tick. I think there's a little bit of a refresh delay. So if I select it, list of VMs now has a value of demo VM. So it has added that value to that array because this condition evaluated to true this time. So, okay, that, that's a good sign. It means our code is working. If we look at the other status, that was false. If we look at the other VMs, these are all false. So none of these evaluated. But now it found that one time it is running. So we're almost there. We basically just now need to actually shut down the virtual machine. So we need to do a deallocate. And once again, there's no built-in action. Now I wanna add this before I add the name to the list. So I'm gonna add a new action. And once again, I have to use HTTP because the Azure Resource Manager does not have that ability to deallocate a VM. It's not built in. So we go HTTP, HTTP. So my method is basically exactly the same thing that I did before. So once again, I wanna to post to that HTTP management. So this time it is a post. I'm gonna use the same ID that we used before from the previous step, the resource ID. And this time I'm gonna do a slash deallocate. So again, that's just from the API, a slash deallocate, deallocate. Once again, I have to authenticate and I'm using the managed identity and I can hit save. So at this point, it should actually do something. 
So if we were to go and look at our VMs, remember the middle one is running. So now if I run it, well, firstly, it should take longer because it's not asynchronously shutting it down. And notice it's not finished. So now it is taking longer to actually run. So this does give us a good indication that, hey, it's actually trying to shut down the virtual machine. And the key point is it should only try and shut down that second virtual machine. It shouldn't try and shut down the first or the third because it's not running, because that would just waste time, which is why we actually went and bothered to do the check. Well, is it running or not? So it should really give us a, an intelligent flow. So that's running, running, running. It normally takes about 40, 45 seconds, so it should be much longer. Okay, there we go. And it's finished. So here we can see for the first VM, so that was the for each, for the first one, that for each status only took 0.9 seconds. I, it didn't do anything. This branching condition was not met. It never got to true for either of the statuses. For our last VM, it only took 0.9 seconds. For our second VM, the one that was running, it took 41 seconds. And here the branching condition, if I go to look at the different statuses, again, it takes a while to refresh sometimes. Let's try this again. Okay, so now when we move between them, we can see this step took 40 seconds, the stop. And if we go and look at it, we can actually see the method was post, status succeeded. So it shut down the virtual machine. And if we actually go and look at my VMs now and hit refresh, it stopped. So I'm gonna now go and restart two of them just to prove that it does um, actually work. And meanwhile, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could get an email telling us, hey, what we shut down? So I'm gonna add one more step all the way at the end. So let's go back to our designer. Now I wanna do this, I'm doing it outside of my for each VM, outside of the for each. So I'm doing this plus all the way down here at the bottom. So I wanna add an action. And the action I wanna add is simply to send an email. So what am I interacting with? Well, I'm interacting, let's have a look. Let's search for send email. So under Office 365, and yes, I have an Office 365 account, we have an option, we have lots of options here, but I can just send an email. Notice there's also things like send approval emails where I can have a list of options. So if I wanted someone to check something, I could send them an approval email and then based on the response, I could choose to proceed like a, a check gate. But actually I didn't mean to do that. I don't want to send an approval email. That was, click the wrong option. Let's delete that quick. I want to just send a regular email. So here we'll go back to send an email. We know it's in the standard. So it's a standard Office 365 and we will do send an email. Now it has to authenticate as someone. My managed identity does not have an email account. So at this point, I would have to put in a credential that I want the Logic app to authenticate with to actually use the email. Now for this, I'm just gonna be lazy and use my email account. So I'm just gonna use my dummy john at savletech.net account. So here I'll just select my account which is fine. Ordinarily, you'd probably create actually some kind of automation account. And I'm just gonna send it actually to me. Um, VMs shut down. And remember, I could do other things here. Remember, we still have dynamic content. We still have expressions. So I could maybe add things around this conversions. There's math, date, and time. So what's the current time? So I could add in VM shut down at whatever the time currently is. And now I'm just gonna say, hey, VMs shut down, and then the list. 
Now, notice it's not showing me my list of VMs variable because my list of VMs variable is an array. But under expressions, one of the things we can do here is convert the parameter to a string. So now it's filled in that. And in the content of the string expression, I can then add in my list of VMs variable. So now it should add in, hey, those list of virtual machines, and I can hit save. So now if we run this again, my VMs hopefully have started by now. Let's just double check that. Yep, so they're running. So that should shut down two VMs. If I hit run, now remember it's gonna take longer. Now it's shutting down two VMs. So if it took 40 seconds before, well now I'm gonna expect it to maybe take over a minute. So it's gonna run for a period of time and through the magic of editing, it will finish. Okay, so that finished. And if we look, actually finished pretty quick, so I'm a little bit concerned. <laughs> So we can see, let's go and check. So if we look at our VMs and refresh. Okay, so one of them is still deallocating. And if I look at my email, okay. VM shut down, I've got a timestamp and I've got the two VMs it stopped, demo VM and demo VM SRV. So my email was sent successfully. It is deallocating and that stopped both VMs and it just completed. My first VM, that one wasn't running, so it never got to the condition. My second VM, as soon as we have to move back and forth to get it to refresh, it did meet the condition. My third VM, I'm a little bit curious about this one. Oh, it did as well, 30 seconds. I think maybe this timer is not correct because one of them took 30 seconds, one of them took 47. So maybe I'm adding my math is wrong somewhere. <laughs> it doesn't seem quite right. But there we can see them actually running through and it did stop um, both of the virtual machines. Now again, this is this new canvas. If I switch to the old canvas for a second and you can go back and forth, well then it actually shows you the results without doing those pop out cards. So it gives you more information on the canvas, but it can get a little bit overwhelming. So the whole point of this new canvas is I go and select each item to actually go and get the details around it. And I can of course use that both for the designing and for the reviewing of the executions as well. Now at any time, firstly, if I go on this left menu, we see there's versions. So I can go and see the different versions as I was actually authoring this Logic app. Yes, it's, <laughs> I started this at 4.20 this morning on a Sunday, just my brain has to warm up a little bit at first. So I can see all the different versions of my Logic app. So I can see a building out over time from really basic all the way through. Just a little change control built in. I can also under overview, see a run history. So here are all of the executions we did and I can always go back and see the values. And again, at any of these, I can go and get the detail of the outputs of what it was actually doing. So I can go and really easily um, go back and troubleshoot and work the things out if something isn't behaving exactly as I wanted it to. So this is really useful to leverage this. There are also some workflow settings available. I can use things like controlling who can access it. There's options around integration accounts, which is a more advanced capability that I'm not gonna cover in this video. There were also the idea of parameters. So I could actually define parameters and I can set default values, but then change them for different maybe clones of the execution. So I have ways of doing that as well. But my goal of this was to really just walk through some of the key basic things. Now, obviously my workflow here is best case. 
I never handle, well, what do I do if something failed, for example? I could maybe have another variable if things fail. And just to show you what I would do is, well, remember this HTTP, again, that's not a very useful title. So I might re rename that to deallocate the VM. And coming out of that, and I could hit save. And again, remember when my condition didn't work, it was just because it had lost that code. I've seen that happen quite a few times when it goes and adds the for each automatically. So just go back and recheck that code hasn't got removed. I think there's a few bugs in this new canvas right now, but they're working on them. But maybe what I should have had here after I deallocate, well, what if something goes wrong? So I could add in a new step, but I'm going to add a parallel branch. And one of the things here is one of the built-in options for a control is called a scope. And what I can do in this scope is I have this run after. So I could say, well, after running deallocate, if it's timed out, is skipped, is failed, but is not successful. So everything other than successful, and I could change it to scope um, if problem. And now what I can do is, hey, if there's problems, add things as part of that scope. Now notice it's got this warning. Again, this seems to be related if I flip out and flip back to it again. Now the scope is working correctly. The other thing I could have done is if you switch to the code view, so there's a code view of all of this. I can write this just in code. Is if I flip to the code view and then back to the designer, that seems to fix it as well. So that code view is actually really nice to maybe go and take a little backup for it. But now I can see the scope, hey, it's only in these scenarios where it didn't work, maybe I've got a different variable of failures and I would add the name to the failures. Because by default, all of these actions that I have going on right here, so hey, we have these settings, the code view, testing. But if I go and look at my add VM name to list, my run after is only if it's successful. So it only gets its name added if that is a successful after that previous step. And now if that isn't the case, I have a parallel branch where it would go if it's not successful. And I do have that for some of the other things. Notice here my parse JSON is only if it's successful. So if that git VM detail had failed, it wouldn't have parsed the JSON. It would have just basically broken out of that for each and gone to the next one. So this deallocate could fail very easily if my managed identity, for example, didn't have the right permissions, maybe it only had read. So the allocate would have failed and it just wouldn't have written the name to the list. But now I could actually go and it's like a try catch. I can go and add particular things I wanted to do if that didn't work. So I would now go and add maybe another variable at the start, initialize a second variable, then go and add, hey, failures. Then in my email, I could add, oh, well, these ones didn't successfully fail to shut down. So hopefully you, you get the idea of this. It helps you just plan out the things. And I deliberately picked a scenario where I had to use a combination of things. So, hey, I could use variables. Hey, I could use some built-in connectors. I can use some logic. Oh, there was an API that didn't have a wrapper, i.e. a connector around, so I had to do a HTTP, but then it was still pretty easy. I was parsing data, using conditions, we used expressions when we converted the name of the variable list of VMs into an actual string. This connector we added for the Azure Resource Manager will now actually show up as an API connection. So on this left here, we have API connections. We should have two. We should have one for Azure Resource Manager and we should have one for the Office 365. So when we added those connectors, the use of them, it automatically added an API connection, which is now associated and used by the Logic App. But that was it at a, a super high level. I would have run through, which I think is a pretty cool 
um, scenario. They're actually built-in tasks for shutting down VMs. I basically recreated something that exists already, but I wanted to walk through the same thing I did with the Azure function. So you can see well, what are the parts involved, and it does give a nice overview of the different pieces of functionality that I have. So as always, um, I hope that was useful, and until next video, take care.